In this episode, I'd like to talk about Agile in general, its history and a bit of theory. Then, in the next episode, I'll try to tell you something about how that theory translates into practice in actual, real developer's teams. So yeah, not much about Scala again. I have an episode about open source in plans, and that one will be more focused on Scala, and after that, I'd like to make a bunch of videos about some features which make Scala stand out from many other programming languages, but I believe that stuff like this is more important. There are tons of coding tutorials on the internet, I'd prefer to approach the subject from the angle of teamwork and how a working program comes together and only then discuss coding practices. I hope that together it will give you a broad picture of how a bunch of programmers can work and produce something useful. Agile software development is a set of ideas about how a team of professionals can work on a product while at the same time improving the way they work with each other. This is where the word Agile comes from. Agility means the capability of changing to better fit the given circumstances. As such, Agile lacks carved in stone definitions. It has guidelines and a very vibrant community of people eager to discuss advantages, disadvantages, deployment, difficulties and side effects of given Agile practices. But in a way, it is possible to define Agile in negative terms, that is, by saying what it isn't. Agile arrived in prominence in the early 2000s as an alternative approach to work management fundamentally different from then-popular methods that came to software development from other industries and relied heavily on preparation and documentation. Imagine that you're building a bridge. How do you do it? You can just build anything and let people use it. If the bridge crumbles, people will die. We have to know that the bridge is safe before even the first person walks on it. What's more, it's not easy to modify a bridge. You can't just build it, test it, decide that, huh, no, no, it's not good enough. Take it down and build it again. It would be way too expensive. The development process used to build bridges has to, therefore, focus on defining exact requirements on the design and testing on small-scale models. When all this is done, the construction team steps in and builds the bridge exactly to the documentation they get. They are not supposed to have their own ideas and alter anything, or they'll risk the future of the whole enterprise. To some extent, the same goes for the car industry, housing, ships and airplanes. All those areas where construction and testing are expensive, so it makes sense to have everything planned out and weed out possible mistakes before the workers actually start to build anything. People who came to software development from industries that work in this way brought their management practices with them. Of course, they saw that software development is different, but the practices they were used to have already grown into and mixed with the whole corporate culture, and it was difficult to modify them. Personally, I blame IBM. For a long time, IBM specialized in big data processing machines, predecessors of current supercomputers. They were mainly interested in expensive hardware, and their software department grew naturally as an offshoot of it. They already had people on the management positions taking care of talking to customers, defining requirements, and writing documentation. It was easy for them to see programmers as construction workers who just have to build what others already agreed on. IBM's success meant that the other companies, especially big corporations like IBM itself, decided to use their methodology as a model for their own. But in software development, it is easy to test in a full-scale or at least something close to the full-scale environment, just as it's relatively easy to modify an already working product. On the other hand, the level of complexity in software is such that, during gathering requirements and planning, it's difficult to see the whole picture. Even a careful designer may forget about a detail, which will make it impossible to implement the whole project the way it was planned. If the errors are then caught during the implementation or the testing phase, someone has to go to the designer, tell them they screwed up, and then everyone has a major problem. Even worse, if the product goes to the customer and then comes back with a list of things which don't work as they should or are totally not what the customer asked for. Ha. Agile points out that software development is fundamentally different from other industries, so different that we should reorganize the whole process around developers, that is, designers, programmers and testers working together closely and on equal footing. And not only that, we can also change the way we think about organizing the development process itself. 
What if it doesn't have to be written down in a book the size of a brick? What if it can be a result of interaction between developers, managers, and agile coaches? That is, people interested in how all of this works and how to make it better. In broad terms, agile can be summarized in the following four principles. One, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Written rules are downplayed in Agile in favor of asking everyone involved how the current workflow and the set of rules suit them, and if not, then what they think should be changed. The feedback is then turned into lists of more or less clearly defined issues, and proposals on how to solve them are being collected and eventually some of them are implemented, so that in this particular case, in this company, the process is improved. Later on, an ambitious Agile coach may write down what was the problem, what were the proposals, what was done in the end, and did it actually help? And she or he can go with all those notes to an Agile conference, share them with other Agile nerds, and maybe, just maybe, what was improved in the company A will be also improved in the company B, which shares similar characteristics to A. But it's not a general rule. Changes happen on a case-by-case -case basis. 2. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Importance of documentation is downplayed in favor of working code, which should be good enough to be understood by all involved parties. Which I have an issue with, because from my experience, it's a very idealistic approach. No code is readable that documentation is not necessary. But I agree that in a project under development, especially under Agile development, the code may change very fast, and keeping the documentation up to date can be a burden with no real value. 3. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Gathering requirements far ahead before their implementation and turning them into a set of tasks which the developers should stick to is downplayed in favor of a more direct connection to customers and or their representatives, so that they can be asked which solution do they prefer from a set of possible options at a moment closer to when the given solution is going to be implemented and they can also try out the implemented feature much faster, even before the final product is ready, and leave the feedback for the team so the product might be improved more to the liking of the customer without much drama. 4. Responding to change over following a plan. In Agile, the plan of how things should work from the planning board to the working, shiny product in the hands of a happy customer, that plan is nothing second can be changed at any moment if needed. The very same rules which we apply to work on the product can be applied to the process itself. Just as the customer may walk in the office in the middle of the development process and say they really wanted something very different, the developers may decide that they are not happy about something in the way they work together and attempt to change it. There is no rule against it. This ability is exactly why we can take Scrum which is one of the most specific and best documented Agile methodologies. Poke it with a proverbial stick made of everything that is happening in the company and see what falls off. Sometimes it's retrospectives. I hate retrospectives. If you hate them too, maybe do Scrum but without retrospectives. Sometimes it's the velocity measures. Sure, maybe you don't need to measure velocity. Maybe it takes too much time. If so, do Scrum without measuring velocity. Sometimes it's the Scrum Master. Well, to be honest, it's always the Scrum Master. In the next episode, I'll talk about how two of the most popular methodologies, Scrum and Kanban, come together in practice and form a pattern followed by the majority of companies that do Agile. I'll also talk a bit about tools that we use to make the process easier or more difficult. And I really do hope it won't take me a month and a half again. As always, if you have any questions or ideas about future episodes, leave me a comment or contact me on Twitter.